little different than normal, um, but just to um, give some thanks to sponsors of this talk is the Prince William Sound Science Center, Alaska Sea Grant, and the Audubon Society, and as well as the Forest Service for your, letting us use their building. Um, if you haven't been here before, or um, if you are attending, please sign in. Um, and this week, like I said, is a little different. We have our high school tsunami bowl team, which the tsunami bowl is the regional competition of the National Ocean Sciences Bowl, which is a quiz style competition. And our regional tsunami bowl that happens in Alaska is in a little over a week. So on the 25th, we will all be headed to Seward to present in our um, quiz bowl competition and also present our talk that we are um, going to get into. I'm not going to explain anything about it because that is what our team is here to do. Um, but I will say part of their project in the Tsunami Bowl is to pick a natural disaster and act as if we, the team, were designing an action plan for a community. So that's what you'll hear about tonight. And without further ado, Travis. Hi, we're the uh, High School Tsunami Bowl team. I'm Travis. I'm Ben. I'm Marie. I'm Corey. And uh, we're going to talk about coastal resilience in Cordova. Um, kind of a history of the natural disaster we chose, which is earthquakes. Um, Alaska has the most earthquakes recorded in the United States, and uh, three of the biggest earthquakes that ha have happened in the United States were in Alaska. And the biggest was the 1964 earthquake that hit South Central Alaska, but mostly Prince William Sound, and affected communities like Cordova and Valdez. And uh, like all South Central could feel it because of the magnitude, which was a 9.2. And um, as you can see right here is Cordova, and we have the most earthquakes out of South Central Alaska, and that's because we're pretty much on the Aleutian uh, Trench, which is a subduction zone between the Pacific Plate and the uh, North American Plate, and the 1964 earthquake was caused by a uh, sudden southeastern motion and uh, released all the tension that had been building up in the subduction zone. Um, and right here, this is the Agataga area, and it's in the highest danger area because A, it's right on the subduction zone or subduction line, and um, there's a whole bunch of tension building up there because we haven't had, there hasn't been an earthquake produced from right there since the 1964 earthquake that we had. And uh, this is important information to make community plans on how to bounce back from a natural disaster like this, with, and, uh, which is called uh, resiliency. And that's a huge need for communities that get affected by that. Um, and resiliency, I've already explained it, but it's basically the ability for a community to bounce back both socioeconomically and ecologically, which is very much, which is very necessary for Cordova because economically we have fishing and if there's an earthquake, everything gets shifted. It's, tsunami could possibly happen, which could damage everything that we have to uh, like process fish and stuff. And ecologically, it can damage uh, habitats for fish, deer, and pretty much everything. And uh, coastal resiliency is a big part of for a coastal community like Cordova because we can make plans on how to prevent tsunamis. And uh, we actually came up with an action plan for Cordova to help prevent, the tsunami, to prevent tsunamis. 
and earthquakes. <coughs> so uh, how do you assess uh, and what is assessing risk for uh, coastal resiliency? Um, so first off, there's um, one of the most effective ways of assessing risk is by using mapping tools. Now mapping tools are very useful tools because they allow us to predict where earthquakes will occur and um, um, they also record down uh, past earthquakes so we know areas where um, they are more likely to be in. So uh, these are two of the earthquake mapping tools which I chose, which was USGS Earthquake Hazard Program and National Earthquakes Hazard Reduction Program. Now, um, over here is the USGS um, Earthquake Hazard Program. And what this is, is a mapping tool which shows uh, here uh, earthquakes, which are the yellow dots. And if you hover your mouse over these, uh, they show you the magnitude of the earthquake and the date and time of these earthquakes. Now, as I said before, these are very useful for um, predicting where they will occur and uh, future or future where they might appear, uh, or where, when they might appear. Um, so, <coughs> modeling tools is the next uh, useful tool for assessing risk. And they don't record data as such, but they are better for creating scenarios. So, scenarios are very good at, uh, for looking at long-term impact. They can show where um, safe zones are for when a earthquake hits or a tsunami hits. They are also useful for um, <coughs> looking at the impact by using layers, uh, which is another part of their uh, scenarios. And yeah. Since our action plan is to help um, I guess bounce back when a tsunami comes. We have potential solutions on how to do that, such as building a barrier, which is the most commonly used, but since it's, it can't really adapt, it loses a lot of um, marine things around it. Uh, we have a natural barrier, which provides habitat, but it's pretty unpredictable. Um, and a hybrid, which is a combination of both, but <coughs> since it's still new, it's, there's limited experience with it. We chose natural barriers because, as we see over here, it can, oh, plants can help reduce wave, wave force. Um, we can't really stop a tsunami altogether, but we can stop how big it happens. And it saves money, it's renewable, and it's easy to include volunteers. Um, so to take action, the first step has to be educating the public on coastal resilience, because if you don't know what exactly it is you're trying to get to, you're not going to get to it. Um, we plan on build, build, uh, planting barrier plants like these in this example, the mangroves. Uh, mangroves themselves would not live in Cordova, but they have proven very effective in places like Bangladesh and Louisiana. It minimizes effects of earthquakes and the resultant waves, especially L waves, which are the most destructive. Um, so, planning on what we're going to use and how we're going to use them. We have to use salt resistant plants because we're focusing on coastal resiliency. And if you put like a field of daisies by the ocean, it's just going to die. Everything's going to be terrible. Um, so, the two best options, as we could see, were beach wild rye lamus mollus and kelp with the um, family being. Lemon areolus and the genus specifically, uh, Nereus cystis. Beach wild rye is currently 
Um, well, currently Gro is mostly in the west coast of Alaska, and it's used for things such as Yupik coil weaving, so it has a purpose beyond just being a handy plant. It does have cultural value, so, or, well, crop value, sort of. And kelp is kelp. It's easy to grow, and we don't have to do anything with it. Um, we should map areas that are most susceptible as Benoit over. And based on where we think the plants would help most, we plant strategically based on that. We have to make sure we do an ecosystem impact survey because many well-meaning projects where we think of adding or reducing something in an environment have ended badly, such as taking the wolves out of Yellowstone, where it's like, this is going to be great, and then it was terrible. It was terrible. And, of course, we have to obtain permits, which is one of the downsides of the natural barriers, is they require far more permits than building does. But I believe that the benefits of having a natural bar eh, barrier outweighs the paperwork. So, first we have to educate people. And to make sure we're actually like doing something, we're going to have to do a pre-tested like a simple survey, like maybe three, five questions, just to see what people know already. And then once we have the results back from that, we can move into things like resilience room, like the discovery room we have now, where about once a month we take children out to teach them about coastal resilience and how it affects us and what they can do to help. Tuesday night lecture series, because everyone enjoys those. Uh, we can donate educational books and flyers to the library so then people can see them on their own terms and we don't have to like force them down their throat because they wouldn't enjoy that. And we can always take out ads in the local newspaper or radio. And then after this we can retest to make sure we're actually making a good difference in their knowledge. If we're not, we're going to have to work harder on educating them. Let's see. To communicate ideas, uh, focus mostly on like how to make people like feel and understand the impacts because if we just tell them, hey, tsunamis are bad, and they'll probably be like, yeah, they won't get it. So it's like, wait, what do you mean we're preventing tsunamis? That requires work. No, suddenly I don't want to do this. So to communicate um, understanding to them, we could do drills like the AK Shield does now, where you know they do scenarios such as plane crash or an earthquake. And we can show models showing like how Cordova can be affected. And if we need a high school or if we need a captive audience, there's always a high school. Since the children in the high school will likely inherit the town that we will be helping. And if they don't understand what's going on, then they might not be too apt to keep the well product, I guess. So to initiate, we're going to need community volunteers like the book, uh, book, book, book Brigade worked out very well. As we can see, Cordova is a community-minded town, and so asking for help, uh, first of all, it increases understanding and, you know, feeling like they've participated, and well, they have. And also, we don't have to pay people. Um, <laughs> But we do need funding. We can get from grants and private donors along with fundraising, but that's kind of more of an extra thing. We, we would need like decent money from grants and private donors. After this, we can share the results so people can see what they've done and how it has affected Cordova. And we can compare the effects of earthquakes before and after implementation, either through models or comparing like smaller scale earthquakes and hopefully not larger earthquakes before and after the planting. Uh. And to conclude it, Alaska is at high risk for earthquakes because of where we are on the North American plate and um, mostly south central and southeastern because of where the subduction zone uh, is. Um, natural barriers can help us uh, slow the force down of tsunamis so that we don't get damaged, so that we don't get as much damage as we would, say, if we didn't have any barriers.
at all. Um, we can educate the community through resources and classes like assemblies, Tuesday night lectures like what we already have, and um, educational books at the library. And we can use our action plan to lessen recovery time so that we can get back to how things have normally been so that we can uh, continue our livelihoods and also uh, like can continue with everyday life you know we can also decrease damages with the action plan so that we don't have to worry about rebuilding uh, certain buildings such as the new Cordova Center So in the, at the competition, they have a 20-minute time limit, which you guys were in, um, with 16 minutes. So good job. And then to simulate the competition, you guys, the audience, can have 10 minutes to ask questions. So take it away. <laughs> so several times someone said that you were preventing either earthquakes or tsunamis. Are no, you preventing? Mitigating. Mitigating. Okay. I'm sorry. And how do you envision a grass or a kelp to reduce the energy associated with a tsunami? Drag. You know, it's, it's trying to go all through the stuff, some of the energy is going to be transferred to the plants, and then since it's slower, the force will go down, and thus will be less destructive. <coughs> So I work for an organization that does a lot of work around invasive plants, and you talked about a plant from western Alaska, even though it's from Alaska, are you, are there reasons that some of the local native plants couldn't be used on, like your grass, for example, that was from western Alaska? Particularly, if you couldn't find information. Not local here, in because of the effects it could have on the local species. Oh, don't let me pick on them. Someone else has <laughs> 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 questions in here. So we've got a large intertidal zone where it's very flat. You know. Um, I'm wondering about, because I was thinking kelp could be a, a great idea, but you know, a lot of that just winds up being dry at certain stages of the tide. So is, are there places you've identified that, might, that you might prioritize in terms of where you can place the plants specifically around Cordova? I mean, I haven't done the research for that, but mapping tools would certainly help with knowing where you would, mm -hmm. because you could use the modeling tool. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And how serious is the risk of a tsunami curve, considering that Auburn is such an enclosed area? Well, um, it depends on the magnitude of the earthquake, really. Like, um, with the 1964 earthquake, <coughs> uh, the tsunamis were mostly generated from uh, landslides that happened because of the earthquake. Like, uh, for example, Valdez, they had an earthquake. They were hit by the earthquake, and uh, the tsunami that hit them was caused by a landslide in the, uh, in Valdez's arm. And uh, I think there was, yeah, there was one down uh, in Evans, on Evans Island, which uh, hit a native village pretty hard, but they have since uh, bounced back from it. And, uh, but depending on the magnitude and how big the wave could get, it could possibly come up the Copper River and then pos and uh, then go into some of the other drainages that go into the Copper River. 
Nelson Bay might be a, a spot where if there was a really large landslide, it could it could be a big problem. Yeah, and we've certainly had. I mean, you can look at Sheridan or Sh Sherman Glacier and uh, see evidence of that. You know, it just wasn't in a marine environment, but you know, it's a big possibility. <coughs> What would happen if, in the next earthquake, instead of Cordoba going up several feet, it went down several feet? Do you think your protection would still work? Well, it's not necessarily to keep, like, you know, the earth from moving up or down. Like, Roots might help with erosion, but if we're going to be moving six feet up or six feet down, then we're going to be moving that way. The earth doesn't care about these new seed plants. Uh, it could like make a sort of buffer zone with the plants taking up um, space to keep the um, water from damaging everything, but I can't say if there's a major, like, as happened in the 1964 earthquake, um, a major shift. I, I can't say it would be like the end all be all of protection. Would Kelp go out of there, Where? Um, Well, was, would kelp grow out there in open? It's just mud out there. Does kelp grow on mud? I don't think kelp really cares about your usual habitat. Yeah. 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 habitat boundaries and where things should grow because they grow on like rocks. So as long as we put some nice kelp anchors there, it'll probably be fine. And then we will be urchins. So this is a design that would stop or help dissipate the tsunami, but have you thought about any implications? There's a lot of boat traffic and um, how to not impede any of the movement, especially for the commercial fishing vessels that can suck up that kind of plant materials with their jets. Someone else has been thinking about that and has not informed me. We have not publicly discussed it between each other. But I don't know, someone here is a fisherman, so have you been thinking of it? Um, I actually kind of did think of it, uh, like possibly get it mapped out somehow on so on the GPS, like how they have the traffic areas for the, uh, like, uh, the ferry and the barges and the oil tankers over in the sound have it mapped out kind of like that, like a, a no-go zone, pretty much, so that you can protect the kelp and also make it so that you don't suck up anything and possibly ruin the jets on your boat. So as you guys are strategizing and choosing what's your best type of option to to mitigate all of these effects and you come up with this answer um, what was the what was the most difficult part about this answer I'd like to know what was the weakest link of this answer that you had to discuss amongst yourselves and come up with a way to present it to us well there's not a lot of research on natural barriers it's kind of a new field mm -hmm. there's Plenty of like, okay, this is how you build a breakwater, this is how you build a jetty, but like, it's really kind of, excuse the pun, murky waters, <laughs> natural barriers, although it has definitely been increased and you can find information on it, it's definitely not localized information, like I know that in Louisiana, an acre of mangroves can uh, lessen the damage by storms by $33,000, but I don't know about in Alaska because we just haven't had the research up here. So that was pretty hard because it's kind of like, well, we don't want to speculate, right. but we also need to find the information. Good answer. Thank you. Have you
you thought about potential uh, benefits that could go along with this besides just the the tsunami mitigation? You know, you talk about resiliency, and I think about I think about all sorts of things. I think about you know being able to bounce back from a natural disaster, but I also think about diversification of our economy, for instance. And, and you start talking about kelp, and I, I know the state wants to, you know, they're actually encouraging people to, to farm kelp as a commercial product. So I'm just wondering if you thought about a way that maybe you could have kelp farms that are serving a dual purpose. They're earning income and they're protecting us. Um, well, we talked about that recently, and I was actually tempted to bribe you guys with kelp snacks. <laughs> I didn't do that because I was told not to. But... Uh, um, as long as it's sustainable and we know that it's not like we're not going to like clear cut all of the kelp and like, oh, sorry guys, no more barrier, but hey, we have kelp. As long as we can see a responsible way to get a good amount of kelp farming, but also leave enough to actually, you know, still work as a barrier, then yeah, we could have an economic benefit. Plus, I'm, I'm currently thinking of sea otters for some reason, urchins eat kelp. Well, kelp bases, and then sea otters eat urchins. More, more kelp means more urchins, which means more sea otters, which even though fishermen hate them, tourists love them, so more tourism. <laughs> Everything is great. More sea otters. It's great for some people in care of the others. <laughs> These are my opinions on sea otters. <laughs> All right, well, you guys survived your 10 minutes of questions, so <laughs> great job. Um, uh, let's give them another. Um, and I'll open it up to um, any other questions or comments or advice as we send our team off to their competition in a week or in about 10 days. Um, keeping in mind their topic of picking a natural disaster um, using information out there, like Corey mentioned, that isn't really um, happening so much in Alaska as of yet, and you know, coming up with a with an action plan for a specific community. I just have one general observation, which is that um, you're all speaking to people who know Cordova really well, but when you present at the Tsunami Bowl, you'll be speaking to an audience for whom Cordova might be really foreign. So I would just say, don't assume that they have a context that allows them to understand all of your comments about Cordova. Um, even, you know, just a simple one like referencing the Tuesday night lecture series. You don't need to go into deep explanations about something like that, but you could just say, in our town, we have a weekly science lecture series. We would envision those types of venues as being a useful place to share information about a program like this. Um, that's the kind of thing that then someone else could imagine, oh yeah, that would be a really neat thing to do in our town too. Um, but just remember that folks are going to be listening to you from all over, and you can help them understand this place better when you describe it to them. Thank you. Since you have more time, um, I would love to hear more from you, Marie, about um, like the natural and man-made barriers going into a little bit more specific examples of maybe where they've been used and how, like, what some of those, like, we heard about mangroves for the natural barriers, but for more than man-made, a little bit more detail about what that means, um, since you have more time. As scary as it is. <laughs> Yeah, and similar on that, just more explanation of why you chose the vegetation barrier that compared oh, to the um, because it's easier to do it here and um, it's safer, I guess, because we're putting salt-based things and we're not really changing, the changing much. That's pretty good. He's getting mad when we're trying to build things so if we can build any things here, we're not going to do it. Yeah, building really It'd be hard to plant things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's kind of like, oh, it's green, as opposed to, what is it with you people in building things? We do not want to Brown. Brown. <laughs> get, get your kelp right. Okay, hey, it's technically, the scenario is just, is it red kelp? It's still uh, kind of red, kelp. Kelp. it's called red <laughs> kelp. It's a different color. It's also beautiful. Kind of. 
is whatever. That's a silly fact. <laughs> Hey, Travis, with the, the Yakutaga, is it a gap? They call it the Yakutaga gap, where, where yes. there hasn't been an earthquake for a long time. Yeah. Um, so that, like, it's building pressure, and it, it, like, didn't slip during the 64 earthquake, or it was part of the 64 earthquake? It was part of the 64 earthquake, and oh. uh, they predicted that it would have slipped again, like, 50 years later, but it didn't. And now they're just waiting for it to slip again because since it didn't slip uh, 50 years after the 64 earthquake, um, there is more pressure building up on it, and they and scientists are thinking that it's going to be bigger and, pr and possibly worse than the 64 earthquake. So it's built up that much pressure in just 50 years. Yes. Think. So, in your maps where you have uh, earthquakes, you need to say something about because it's obviously not all earthquakes. You know, is it earthquakes above a certain magnitude? Is it how did those maps get generated? Because that's not, especially like the first one, is not the actual hotspot for earthquakes within that map region. And so I'm kind of curious, how did you, how did you end up with that map? Um, the primary source that I used, uh, they gathered, uh, they had a map with some data that they uh, gathered from recorded earthquakes that happened, and um, the primary source was mostly talking about like earthquakes in South Central Alaska, and so they used mainly uh, recorded earthquakes that uh, we felt in South Central Alaska or had. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's, most of those earthquakes are along the Alaska Peninsula, and so it really comes down to a question of you know, if it was above a certain magnitude, that would may change your focus a little bit. Or if it was along a particular slip line, that may change your focus. But if you look at a full map of earthquakes, it'll push more towards the Alaska Peninsula. All right. But another thing, just like, I've been to a few of these, and one thing it seems like with the judges, like they definitely recognize that this um, sort of project. Like, don't be afraid. Like, if you learn something, like, when I've learned something since you wrote the paper and submitted it, um, I think the judges recognize that learning is a process that continues and didn't just stop because you turn in the paper. So if, if you, like, learn something new, um, you know, like, as you're preparing to answer questions, like, uh, I've never seen somebody get dinged for <laughs> adding additional information, even if it wasn't on your original paper. Um, you know, you don't have to be sneaky about it. Um, you can say that we've since learned. Um, but, uh, but I just keep that in mind as you're going through. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the ones grading the orals have not seen the papers, so they oh. actually don't know what's in the paper. Right. I mean, uh, should we all be like up in our earthquake insurance? Like, is it that bad? <laughs> like, is, like, uh, like uh, we look, looked into the earthquake insurance. It's really expensive. Is that part of the reason why it's so expensive? Is we're kind of in a spot that really should be having a big one? Like, would you suggest that to your parents? Like, hey, we need to get on well, this insurance thing? Like car insurance, I would think that it would depend on the region you live in. But here in like, Peru. Oh. Yeah. Um, they probably have looked at the data from earthquakes that Alaska has had, and specifically, like, the region of Alaska you live in. So that could possibly affect why Earthquake insurance is really high. Do you think it'd be worth it? Should we spring um. the cash? Close enough to make our lives unhappy, that's for sure. Uh, okay, it's okay, 50 it's, years. It's, 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 it's not, not a matter of if. Yeah. 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 It's, it's not a matter of if. It depend on like your building structure. Like if you live in a really old wooden house, probably worth it because if we have even a not 
1964, but say an eight point something, then you're probably going to get hurt if you're in an old house that has no real earthquake protection. But if you're like in a modern one or one with like concrete walls or good barriers that small windows, generally an earthquake resilient design, it's, you're probably fine for now. For now. For I guess now. the other question would be how deep do they expect the earthquake to be? Because you know, that has a lot to do with the actual uh, shaking that you get on the oh. surface. I actually did look for that, but I couldn't find anything that said how deep they were expecting it to be. It's because they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> is Yakutaga on a, is that a separate little piece of, uh, <coughs> it's not the main subduction, that's actually a slip joint, isn't it? Where yes. the piece is doing a kind of a reverse move? Yes. And it's going to be higher kind of all smashed in there with all sorts of stuff coming from all different directions. We had a Tuesday night talk two years ago was it on earthquakes. Yeah. Did you come there? Mm -hmm. And the guy I gave you was an expert. You know, and he had these maps. And I asked him a question at the end. He said, so would you live in Cordoba? And he never answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that answered the question. <laughs> he just sidestepped. He just said, right, next question. <laughs> Yeah, but he lives in Palmer, so... <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a bit suspicious. Palmer didn't feel the last earthquake that we had uh, back in January. Some people slept through it. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she was working so hard on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not living on a six and a half now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people are out of state. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much, and thank you for your feedback. Nice job.